Mr. Loker. May it please the court. Good morning. Steve Loker on behalf of the appellant, American Interstate Insurance Company. <clears throat> this is an appeal from an insurance bad faith case arising out of my client's handling of a workers' compensation claim. A jury in Pottawatomie County awarded substantial compensatory and punitive damages, and we have appealed most aspects of that award. I want to start by talking about compensatory damages, the single largest category of which was the jury's $150,000 award for lost use of money damages. And the theory was that there was a delay in Mr. Thornton receiving this lump sum partial commutation that caused him two different forms of damage. One is uh, he alleged that he intended to buy a house and because of the delay wasn't able to buy that house and therefore lost the equity that he would have built up. Then second, he argued that he suffered $114,000 in lost investment income, which represented the money that he would have seen in terms of investment growth during the period of delay if he had gotten the lump sum sooner. That second theory of damages in principle is fine. It's basically a lost time value of money theory. As executed here, though, it suffered from a fundamental legal problem. In the underlying workers' compensation proceeding, in order to get that partial commutation of his benefits, Mr. Thornton had to convince the workers' compensation commissioner that he had a reasonable plan for the investment of that money. He represented to the deputy commissioner that he intended to invest those money, uh, that money in something called the AMP Wealth Management Fund, which was a non-stock market-based, very conservative investment portfolio. The deputy commissioner specifically relied on those representations in deciding to award the partial commutation. At trial in this bad faith case, Mr. Thornton's counsel began to argue for the first time that the proper measure of damages for lost use of money and lost investment income was not the performance of that fund where he actually invested the money, but instead should be based on the performance of a hypothetical amount of money in this S&P 500, which is a stock market-based index. In other words, they disavowed the position that they had taken before the Workers' Compensation Commission. This court has made clear on at least a couple of occasions that you can't do that. You can't tell the deputy commissioner one thing in a workers' compensation proceeding and then come back in the district court and say something different. Judicial estoppel prevents you from doing that. And the two cases in particular are Winnebago Industries versus Haverly and Wilson versus Liberty Mutual Group. We would ask the, uh, the court to apply those cases here and remit the lost investment income portion of the award down from 114000 to zero. What, 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 does from, the what does the record reflect with respect to whether or not uh, the claimant, or I'm sorry, Mr. Thornton, had changed his mind about the investment? Um, and my understanding is he's relying on his brother, I think, but correct me if I'm wrong on that issue. You're right that that's who's relying on, but the testimony is not really there, at least not to the extent that he wishes it was. His brother, Tim Thornton, helped him with some of his financial decision-making. Tim Thornton himself said, we were not going to put this money in the S&P 500. We weren't because it wasn't a safe enough investment. He also testified, though, that had Mr. Thornton received the lump sum sooner and in a slightly larger amount, that Mr. Thornton could have been a little bit more risky with respect to his investment decisions. There, did any individual testify that the money actually would have been invested in the S&P 500 if it had been received at an earlier time? No. And in fact, Tim Thornton said it was never going in the S&P 500. And, and in fact, he actually invested it in the, the dentist fund or whatever it's Correct. Called. The dentist fund, also known as the Amp Wealth Management Fund. So the, the fund where he actually put the money was not the fund or the investment portfolio that he used to try and measure his damages. And that was a different approach than he had taken in the first trial. Remember, this is the second time this court is uh, hearing this case. In the first trial, he argued that damage theory appropriately, in my view. He based it on the fund where the money was actually invested. It came out in that instance to about 14000 in lost use of money. Now he's at 114 thousand because he's chosen this uh, alternative investment. And I just add to that, if you look at trial exhibit 375, these are reports that were submitted to the Deputy Workers' Compensation Commissioner. In the course of those reports, uh, Mr. Sims, who was serving as Mr. Thornton's attorney at the time uh, as well as he is now, 
and the financial advisor, Brad Kingsbury, who was also helping Mr. Thornton make investment decisions, there was correspondence where they basically agreed that even if the lump sum had been received sooner, it was still going in that same AMP Wealth Management Fund. So for all of those reasons, we believe that judicial estoppel clearly applies here and requires a remitter of that portion of the award. We also believe remitter is required with respect to home equity, but I'm not going to cover that issue today. I'll rest on the briefs because I want to get to some others. The next biggest category of compensatory damages was loss of mind and body damages in the amount of $100,000, plus physical pain and suffering in the amount of $40,000. Those two awards stemmed entirely from alleged bad faith associated with American Interstate's handling of a replacement wheelchair for Mr. Thornton in 2014. In other words, if there was no bad faith in connection with the replacement wheelchair, there is, in our view, clearly no other basis in the record to sustain those two awards. The underlying facts are these. Mr. Thornton got a prescription for the wheelchair from his doctor in July of 2014. He didn't get the wheelchair itself until November of 2014, and he suffered an elbow injury during the intervening period that he alleged was American Interstate's fault due to the delay in the replacement of that wheelchair. The problem is that the record is clear that there were two things that had to happen in order for him to get that wheelchair after the prescription was written, neither of which American Interstate had any part in. The first is that Mr. Thornton's treating physician, Dr. Rogie, had to prepare a durable medical equipment order, or a DME order, that uh, contained all the information that was needed in order for the wheelchair to be prepared and ordered. And second, Mr. Thornton had to go to the occupational therapist in order to get measured for the wheelchair. This is not a pull-off-the-shelf, one-size-fits-all kind of item. It needs to be tailored specifically to him and his size and his physical restrictions. Dr. Rogi, the treating physician, did not complete the paperwork that he needed to complete until sometime in August of 2014. Mr. Thornton did not get to the occupational therapist until sometime in mid-September of 2014. American Interstate had nothing to do with those delays. So the question really, and it has wide-reaching effects, I would argue, well beyond the scope of this case, the question is if a doctor or an insured is moving too slowly, in completing steps that have to be taken for the insured to receive some sort of medical equipment or medical care, does the insurance company have an obligation to step in and make everybody hurry up? And if the insurance company fails to do that, does that mean the company has acted in bad faith? We believe that there is no support in the existing law for that kind of obligation, that kind of proactive obligation on an insurance company. Instead, courts applying Iowa law generally have held that an insurer is not responsible for someone else's delay or omissions or conduct. We would ask that the same principle be applied here and that the $100,000 for uh, loss of mind and body and $40,000 for physical pain and suffering be remitted uh, or reduced to zero. Are you saying that American Interstate had notice in the summer that the wheelchair needed to be replaced? On this record, there is sufficient evidence that they had notice in mid-July that a prescription had been written for the wheelchair, yes. But there's nothing they can do at that point in time because the doctor still has to prepare the DME order and Mr. Thornton still has to go get measured for the wheelchair, neither of which the insurance company plays any part in. He, he takes care of, Mr. Thornton takes care of those details and Dr. Rogi takes care of those details himself. So on notice, yes, but in terms of whether there was anything that they actually could have done at that time, the answer is no. I want to spend uh, the rest of my time on punitive damages. The jury awarded $6.75 million in punitive damages here, which, based on the existing compens uh, compensatory damage award, represents a ratio of almost 18 to 1 punitives to compensatory. And that ratio grows if the court accepts any or all of our arguments on remitter of the compensatory damage award. To the best of our research, since the United States Supreme Court decided Campbell versus State Farm in 2003, there has not been a single reported insurance bad faith case anywhere in the country in which an appellate court has affirmed an award at or near an 18 to 1 ratio in a case involving substantial compensatory damages. Not a single case. 
By contrast, there are dozens of reported cases, many of which we've cited in our briefs, in which appellate courts have remitted large punitive damage awards from the double digits or high single digits down to something at or very near a one-to-one -one ratio. There are three guideposts that the court has to consider as part of making that analysis for what the appropriate level of punitive damages is. The first is the reprehensibility of the defendant's conduct. The second is that ratio that I just described of punitive to compensatory damages. And the third is comparable civil penalties for similar conduct. Why do you think the jury's award of punitive damages was so high in this case? You know, it's hard to say. Um, and, and one of the problems, and, and this gets to a standard of review issue that I wanted to make sure to emphasize, with a general verdict like this, we just don't know whether the jury decided that the defendant's conduct was very reprehensible, or maybe the jury decided that the defendant's conduct wasn't very reprehensible at all, but since it was such a big company, or at least perceived to be a big company, th that justified some sort of bigger award. We just don't know. From a standard of review standpoint, though, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, has made clear that this court reviews the issue of punitive damages de novo. So you make your own independent assessment of the record and don't uh, necessarily draw any inferences from the size of the award the jury decided to make. The, the jury did consider these factors that you're asking us to consider. To some degree, the jury did. Uh, although That's the what jury, they were instructed, weren't they? That's right. And you have to assume they follow the instructions. Th that's right as well. However, in uh, Leatherman uh, versus Cooper Industries, for example, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 2001, the U.S. Supreme Court said, we require juries uh, to do things that juries are not necessarily well equipped to do. And that's why in the field of punitive damages, the review needs to be de novo. Appellate courts are much better than the jury in any particular case at deciding what the due process limits are on an award of punitive damages, or what the award needs to be in order to ensure that there's sufficient but not excessive uh, deterrence benefit from the award. So case after case after case in this area has evaluated punitive damages, notwithstanding the fact that a jury may have been properly instructed on the size of those awards. And we'd ask this court to undertake that same de novo exacting review here. What is, what is the outside limits that your researchers found uh, on punitive damages, the ratio uh, that comply with due process after the Campbell case? If you've got a substantial amount of compensatory damages, the ratio is pretty close to four to one. Now, I'm not saying there haven't been some cases that have gone higher than four to one. There have. But if you look at the cases in the aggregate, the overwhelming clustering of those cases is somewhere between one to one and four to one. And that makes sense because Campbell itself talked about four to one being pretty close to the outermost limit. To the extent we, there are- If we grant the uh, uh, remitters you're requesting, do we, are we left with a substantial compensatory award? And, and what? How much do you need for, for that? Yes, even if you granted every single request we've made for remitter, you still end up at $57,000. And courts have concluded that yes, that is substantial. For example, we cited an Idaho case where 18,000 in compensatory damages was deemed sufficiently substantial that only a four to one ratio was permitted. And in the Bullmeyer case here in the Southern District of Iowa, you had only $10,000 in compensatory damages, and yet the ratio had to be no more than four to one, according to uh, Judge Pratt. And that case incidentally involved the mishandling of a workers' compensation claim under Iowa law, so it's a particularly helpful precedent, I would argue. The only other cases where you see large compensatory, uh, excuse me, large ratios of punitive to compensatory damages are uh, a few outlier cases where a defendant caused somebody's death. So the Philip Morris tobacco cases, for example, courts have said if you engage in a decades long campaign to deceive people about the health effects of smoking and you cause thousands of deaths, that justifies a higher ratio. We don't have anything even remotely approaching that conduct here. Instead, what we've got is a situation by, where, by the jury's own finding, there was no bad faith for the first three plus years that my client handled uh, Mr. Thornton's file. And in fact, if you look at the record, Mr. Thornton was consistently expressing satisfaction with how his claim was being handled. 
American Interstate made very reasonable settlement proposals, which this court has already concluded in its uh, May 2017 opinion were not bad faith. Those settlement proposals offered more in benefits to him than he could hope to receive through litigation in the workers' compensation uh, proceedings. So we've got a long history here of good conduct before we get to the bad, and that should be an important part of the analysis under the reprehensibility factor and the other factors that this court uh, has to consider. And with that, I'll uh, allow my opposing counsel to present his argument. Thank you. Mr. Seams, do you have an argument? Your Honors, may it please the court, uh, counsel. My name is Taryn and Sims. I'm proud to represent Toby Thornton, who's in court uh, with us today, together with uh, Toby's brother, Tim, and uh, Toby's children, uh, Aaliyah and Garrett. Uh, Your Honors, I, I thought that perhaps the appellant would start with the argument of all the things that American Interstate uh, did right, and that's what they argued at trial, the first trial, this trial, and in their briefs. Uh, of course, that's where counsel finished his argument, is you look at everything that they did correctly as if somehow that excuses the bad faith conduct that this jury found happened on at least three occasions. Uh, indeed, if we look at the record, we have three administrative law judges, all who made note of the bad conduct of American Interstate Insurance at various phases. We have the permanent total disability uh, hearing, we have the uh, uh, partial commutation, which didn't constitute bad faith as a matter of law, as this court found, and there was a specific instruction on that. However, there was evidence at trial about their purpose in doing that, which was consistent with these threats that I'll talk about here uh, shortly, to delay, deny, run up legal fees, and to draw this out over a matter of years. Uh, we had a third administrative law judge on a, uh, a uh, petition for alternate medical care, which counsel never mentions. Now that was a consent judgment, but it comes after uh, the defense counsel on the workers' compensation claim was instructed to go thwap Mr. Sims, stick it to him. Uh, really what they were doing is sticking it to Mr. Thornton. And uh, their counsel referring to these requests for the wheelchair as drivel. So we've got these three administrative law judges who chided the appellant for its behavior leading up to this. And of course, we have two separate juries that found that there was a need for substantial punitive damages uh, in the first trial and, and then the second on a little bit more of a limited scope. Uh, we have two separate district court judges who uh, affirmed those verdicts. And of course, this court in the first appeal in Thornton 1 uh, that affirmed and uh, in part at least the court uh, district court's finding that as a matter of law at least as of March 11 2013 there was bad faith conduct and, and as well uh, these courts should have uh, so found when we look at their behavior in the context of the uh, Campbell guideposts um, we see why this verdict should be affirmed can you address specifically the delay with respect to the wheelchair and the damages associated Absolutely. with that. Uh, Your Honor, uh, first, we're inventing facts that don't exist in the record. Counsel suggests that certain things had to happen over which American Interstate had no control. Well, that's not consistent with their arguments at trial or their brief. If you look at the evidence and the arguments that they made, Justice McDonald, what you see is uh, the defendant argues, well, they didn't have notice in July. Now they're admitting that they did because Jamie Rogers lied under oath multiple times on this very issue. And what they argued at trial and in the brief is, well, as soon as she had notice, she leapt into action and within a matter of days, as they put it, she effectuated the uh, placement of this wheelchair. Uh, so the, the delay starts with the fact that she lies, again, under oath, and saying, I had no idea that that wheelchair was in play, even though... I, I thought the evidence indicated that she acted when they received an order, not that she had some sort of other notice. Is Close, that... not quite, uh, Justice. What, what she said is, I will do something. This is a first deposition that was taken, okay? The, the record hadn't been circulated at this point either to Mr. Thornton's counsel or to Jamie Rogers, the claims representative, that the uh, treating physician, Dr. Rogge, who was chosen by the defendant, uh, had written a script and had uh, uh, made a notation that he needs it. What they did have before that was an independent medical examiner from their own hand-chosen physician, Dr. Broghammer, who said he's going to need that wheelchair about every five years. 
we were right about that anniversary when Jamie Rogers was deposed the first time, and so the question was posed to Ms. Rogers, hey, is there a wheelchair on the radar at all? And she said, not that I'm aware of, if I'm aware of one, and if I'm ordered to provide it, I will do so. This is what provoked the alternate medical care petition as soon as it did become aware that there had been a script already in play. Okay, so it wasn't quite that she said, well, she's when waiting. Was the, when was the, the, the script in play? Uh, when was that prepared by Dr. Rogge? Immediately, the same time what, as... What date? Uh, that would be July, I want to say it was about July 24th. It was the date of the appointment that uh, Mr. Uh, Thornton had. And then had. didn't Mr. Thornton testify he gave it to you? No, I don't think that was a testimony. I think we'd have to look at that. I think there was some confusion on that, and I think he backed off of that. The, 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 I think the record shows that there was email from the vendors that went to the defendant uh, claims representative saying, where are we on this wheelchair? We need to get this moving. It was the vendors that are selected by American Interstate who said, we need to get this rolling because we don't have approval to get this done. Can you identify for me where in the record that notice issue is? Because in your brief, at least as I read it, you cite to this appendix page that has an email from you in late September where you're talking about the delay, but I couldn't find a document, and I haven't seen you point to one that indicates the carrier actually had notice of the order. The, uh, it's testimony primarily, Your Honor. Uh, so when we look at uh, in the uh, transcript of the trial testimony, and it's in the appendix, I believe it's part two at pages 319 and 322. And what we see is Jamie Rogers testifying that as per usual practice, what happens is a, uh, an appointment takes place, a bill is generated, the bill goes to the claims representative, in this case Jamie Rogers, along with the bill. She scrutinizes both of those to ensure that, hey, this is related, we're going to pay that. And within that record, on that same date, Dr. Rogge says, We've written a script for the wheelchair. Jamie Rogers in her first deposition says, I don't know anything about a wheelchair. When the vendor emails everyone and says, where is this wheelchair? We have a second deposition of Jamie Rogers. And at trial, she testified within about a week of any given uh, of those appointments, I would have had the record, I would have had the bill, I would have scrutinized both of those. And now she changes her testimony, sworn testimony in both instances. Now she changes her testimony. And again, you'll find this at page uh, 319, lines 4 through 16, and 322, line 16, through 323, line 6. And what she says is, I did see it. And I, now she's changing her story from, I didn't see it, to now, well, I saw it, but it wasn't my fault. It was the doctor's fault. It was other people's fault. Again, keep in mind, their brief said, within days of her becoming aware of this, she leapt into action. That's completely inconsistent with the argument that she had no obligation or ability to do this. In Iowa, under the workers' comp scheme, the employer controls the care. They have the obligation to provide that care. It's not up to the claimant to say, okay, now I'm going to get fitted for the wheelchair by going to this place or this place. This is Toby Thornton's first wheelchair replacement that he had had at that point for a permanent chair. So it, to suggest that it was Toby or the doctor, by the way, who is the defendant's agent, to suggest it's their fault is completely contrary to what they themselves argued. But, Your Honor, that's where you'll find that testimony about so the notice. I, I guess my follow-up is, is how do they place an order if he hasn't been fitted for the wheelchair? This is all on the defendant in order for them to do that. They're the ones who have to effectuate that. So, and Your Honor, this was vetted thoroughly at trial. This is a lot of cross-examination that they offered at trial. And at the end of the day, the, the jury determined, partly because Jamie Rogers lied, because she had the information much sooner, and because there was some urgency to this, because the earlier medical records are talking about the dilapidated condition of Toby Thornton's wheelchair and how it needed to be replaced. So that urgency was completely disregarded by the defendant. That, I, that seems a little bit contrary to me based on my understanding of work comp. So let's take it in a, a different kind of case where somebody needs to treat with a physician uh, for physical therapy or whatever the issue is. My understanding is typically the insurance carrier would not be the one that would be scheduling the appointments and ensuring the claimant um, was seeing the necessary physicians to get done, the treatment, et cetera. 
that needs to be done. Am I am I wrong? You, in, you are a little bit, but if I may explain, Your yeah, Honor. Certainly. Uh, so in Iowa, one of the benefits from the defense standpoint is that they control all medical care, which would include fitting the wheelchair, it would include the doctor who prescribed it, it would include all the vendors down the line. Toby Thornton doesn't pull out a phone book and say, here's who I'm going to see. The insurance carrier arranges for all of that. Sometimes it's through a nurse case manager, but always they get to control the care. That's a benefit. They get to deny any care if a claimant says, you know what, the doctor said I get a new wheelchair, I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to get a wheelchair there. They have to do it per the insurance company's approval and authority or they'll deny it altogether. In, in Iowa, isn't it uh, the case that if you go do it on your own, and there's any bill associated with what you do on your own that's not authorized, it comes out of your pocket, the worker's pocket, not the insurance company. Precisely. We've had, we have many cases. That Justice that. Wiggins, that's exactly what we call it, is unauthorized care. It's a defense to that type of treatment. Now, with the, the ability to control the care comes an obligation. If you're going to control it, well, then you also have to be in charge of the logistics. Again, reconcile their brief and their argument where they say as soon as she had notice, she leapt into action. So it's your position that, you know, I, again, I'm, we'll all have to look at the record on this, um, but if Dr. Rogi didn't get the order for the, the DME equipment order done, that um, American Interstate would be responsible for his delay because they selected him? Well, I think that's, uh, there's an agency issue there, and that was, again, vetted with the jury as well. With due respect to the court, we need to give some deference to what the jury heard and the jury making its determination because the, the, the only thing that's new out of this argument is made up evidence saying, well, the only way this could happen is if Toby did it. That's not in the record. It, I 100% I, I, I agree, but I, the notion that a physician is the agent of the insurance company for purposes of a bad faith case, that, that seems like a novel proposition. I, I'd agree it's novel, but uh, and I don't know that we even need to get there, to be quite honest, Your Honor, because we have to take a step back and say, what did Jamie Rogers know and when did she know it? And if she had embraced that information earlier, as we described about authorized care, what would she have done with that information? Don't take my word for it. Take the defendant's word for it and what they put in their brief. She would have leapt into action within two days of discovering that this vendor said, where is this? She effectuated that wheelchair getting into place. The fact of the matter is the jury heard all of this, and the jury concluded. And if, if you look at some of the prior pleadings, which, of course, don't necessarily have a, uh, a bearing on this, uh, Judge Larson indicated on the wheelchair issue in post-trial uh, post decision on Thornton 1 Taken alone, maybe there was an innocent explanation for this. But when you look at the threats, the prior delays, everything else that was done, this really looks more like a pattern. And the, the jury drew that same conclusion. So this is a great uh, transition to talk about reprehensibility because we've already talked about quite a bit of it. It's not simply the wheelchair. It, was, it starts with the date the jury fixed. Hey, can I actually certain. shift gears? Because I want to make sure we get time to hear from you. I I'm interested in the award of damages for loss of use of money. Certainly. What is the evidence that the money would have been invested in this S&P 500 vehicle as opposed to the dentist fund? Well, let's start with the, this argument about judicial estoppel or uh, th those types of arguments. That That's kind of more a legal proposition. I'm more, sure. even if that argument is no good, Right. Where's, where's the hard evidence in the record that the, a different investment would have been pursued? So the jury heard evidence that all options were in play per Toby Thornton, his brother, and Brad Kingsbury. Brad Kingsbury wasn't involved until later. And the, the reason I wanted to go back, Justice Manfield, just a little bit and answer the, the question you didn't ask that I, is because we're talking about apples and oranges here. Counsel would have this court believe that because Toby Thornton said to the work comp court, this is what I am going to do with this pool of money, therefore he's a stop from arguing anything different in the bad faith trial. The fact of the matter is this pool of money was different than the pool of money that he would have had earlier. Not just because it would have been earlier and he could have been more aggressive, but it hadn't been spent down at that point. Well, let me time. be a little sharper. Let, let, let me suggest to you that I see no evidence in the record. That I've, that I've seen, and I want you to help me because you're more familiar with the record than I am, sure. of course. 
I see no evidence in the record uh, that would support the view that this money would have been invested in the S&P 500. Could it have been invested? The answer to that is yes. It could have been put in the bank. It could have been put in uh, paper bags. A lot of good things could have happened. But what evidence is there in the record? And give me a testimony, testimony or an exhibit. Or what evidence is in the record that the money um, had uh, the insurance company not acted in bad faith would have been put in an S and P 500? It's a little bit like a spoliation question. All right, so the insurance oh, no, company no. destroyed I just, it. I, I just want I want a record site. I, I, I want a record site. I want some testimony. I want an exhibit. Something other than I mean, could it have happened again? The answer is yes. Right. Um, clearly. So, uh, but that, that, the answer <laughs> that to the question, guess. Your Honor, is, is, is twofold. Uh, first of all, we do, have, we do have Tim Thornton saying that it would have been more aggressive if it, w if it was earlier. Okay. And then we also have. Uh, no, actually, that's not what he said. He, he said he could have. He, he, he could have been a bit riskier is what he I said. I think that's what I said. If I said something different, I think that's what I said, Your Honor. Could, could is the word. I agree. Word. No, I agree, and I think I use that same word, Your Honor. But here's the problem with trying to answer, answer that question. But, and by the way, there was an economist then who came and testified at trial as well. It, we can't go back and reinvent history when the defendant has already destroyed that possibility to do that. And so you, the jury was forced with a difficult determination to imagine what what was the lost chance taken from Toby? Because it, it's a question without an answer as soon as they depleted that fund. Now it's a different uh, scenario altogether. Since Toby never had that money, he never had the opportunity to say, here is what I'm going to do with it. So we had to go back and say, what could he have done with it? What is it that they destroyed? And it's not just that we looked at S&P. Lots of cross-examination on the uh, plaintiff's expert, uh, the economist, about, okay, well, let's look at some downturns. Let's look at the dentist fund. Let's look at these different options. And the jury ultimately determined, defendant, what you deprived Mr. Thornton of was that opportunity to invest in this way. And the jury determined, based on the evidence that they heard, if he would have been more risky, and the economist saying this is more risky than the dentist fund, the jury determined this is what he would have been able to do. And, and so, Your Honor, I, I submit to you that I can't give you a citation because of what the defendant did. Uh, and Justice Mansfield, I want to make sure that I answered your question I as well before I, I move. Okay, uh, certainly. Uh, so when we look at the reprehensibility and we look at the factors. Your, your time's up. If you want to just take a few minutes. Uh, a I, I minute beg your pardon. I didn't please. see the stop. I, uh, if, if I may, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, a very small point. The uh, three factors, when they exist, then the punitive damages generally should be upheld. We're looking at an 18 to 1 split for the actual compensatory damages that were awarded. But when you look at the threat of potential harm, which was $1.2 to $2.3 million that the company was trying to save, that split is a lot less than that. With that, we would ask that the uh, court affirm the jury verdict on this second appeal uh, and allow Mr. Thornton to uh, move on with his life. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Any rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. Let me try to pin down the timing on this wheelchair issue with some actual uh, citations to the record. We know that in early July of 2014, Mr. Thornton received the prescription for the wheelchair. Now, two different things were uh, conflated during that argument. There's the prescription, which is just a sheet of paper that says he needs a new wheelchair. And then there is the DME order, which is a long document that describes all the features the wheelchair needs. Was the prescription given to the insurance company? A copy of the doctor's progress note that would have made reference to the prescription would have been sent to the insurance company in the middle of July. That's but, all they would have had so at that point. So the insurance point. company knew there had to be a wheelchair. What did they do in response to that prescription to facilitate the wheelchair? At because that, he can't go out and buy it himself. No, he can't, and, and that's where the doctor comes in. Dr. Rogi needs to prepare the paperwork that's necessary for him to go get fitted for it. If you look at Dr. Rogi's office note dated August 4th of 2014, which was the next monthly appointment that Mr. Thornton had, this is at, uh, the third appendix, pages 114 and 115. There is a reference in Dr. Rogi's progress note that Dr. Rogi still needed to prepare the paperwork. 
in order to allow Mr. Thornton to get the new wheelchair. Did the, why didn't the insurance company, when they saw the wheelchair was needed, because it's their obligation to get reasonable and prompt medical care, contact the doctor's office and say, let's get this thing moving? It seems that's what the jury was concerned with. The problem is that Mr. Thornton was always responsible for his own care. And, and I agree with the insinuation in the question that the insurance company is not an agent of the doctor. In fact, I think that's a very dangerous uh, precedent to set. But, but it doesn't Justice Williams make a reasonable point. I mean, what's, there, it seemed like these people were talking to each other, communicating all the time. Uh, what's the big deal? Why couldn't American Interstate have called up Dr. Rogge and say, hey, we see there's an indication he needs a new wheelchair. Can you get us a, D, a DME order? So I don't know that there was that much uh, communication between the insurance company and the doctor. Almost all of the communication was actually between the doctor and Mr. Thornton. In theory, I suppose the insurance company could have done that, but that really gets to the heart of the issue. Isn't Is it bad faith for them not to have done isn't it? Isn't their obligation to do that? Because he can't go out and get that medical. He can't go out and get that chair without the insurance company's authorization. And they're the ones who know what you need to get a chair. He doesn't know what they need to get a chair. The, the, the doctor is probably in the best position to know what you need to do to get a chair. Um, but there was nothing at that point in time for the insurance company to authorize. They can't authorize anything until the DME order actually gets prepared. And when Mr. Sims characterizes testimony as lies, that's not consistent with the record. What really happened was the first time the DME order was sent to American Interstate was in late September of 2014. And the claims manager immediately referred it to the vendor to start the process of getting that chair ordered. On October 10th of 2014, for the very first time, there was a, a request for American Interstate to authorize the, the chair. And American Interstate's claims manager responded within about an hour and 15 minutes saying, authorized. But couldn't the jury find that your client knew the process, knew how, to, how it'd be done, and didn't do it and, and just let the thing linger until the doctor got the DME order? I don't think the record really supports that here because of the degree to which Mr. Thornton and Dr. Rogge handled his care on their own. The record was clear that American Interstate always received information after the fact about what he was doing. And in fact, he actually repaired his old wheelchair during this very same period of time. He repaired it in August of 2014 and sent the bill to American Interstate afterwards. Those are great arguments, but the jury could have found otherwise. And, pro and did found otherwise, according to their verdict. Here's the issue. If the jury's verdict is allowed to stand in this area, the concern that I have is that we are really stretching the bad faith tort. And suddenly, instead of a denial or some sort of active delay by the insurance company, we are putting the insurance company in a position where it has to proactively go out and make sure the insured is doing something or the insured's doctor is doing something in order to get the care that the insured what, what needs. What weight do we give the um, statutory penalties for bad faith delay in, in applying the third uh, guidepost? A tremendous amount of weight. And in fact, in the Bowmeyer case, it was given a lot of weight. Here, there was no penalty that could have been awarded because there was never a denial of benefits. In fact, Mr. Thornton and his counsel didn't even ask for it. So that guidepost weighs overwhelmingly in favor of the excessiveness of this verdict. And if there are no further questions, then I'll rest by simply asking the court to remit both the compensatory and punitive damage awards. Thank you very Thank you. much. The case of Thornton versus American Interstate Insurance Company is now submitted. You may recess court till this afternoon. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.